Today is the 1st of June, the celebration of Children's Day, and we're going to jump into the subject of children's health and the importance of striving to keep the health in our children. I was going to, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about children's uh, health, uh, following on from my earlier presentation about radioactive pollution. And then I'm going to sort of ask you all to consider stepping back from the immediate problem and trying to see the problem behind the problem, and then the problem behind the problem and behind, behind the problem, because this is always the best way to succeed if we are trying to sort of make some kind of progress. Because things are not always what they seem. You might say that people are militaristic, you might say that children are, 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 are um, naturally um, hostile to each other, that at schools you can see them bashing each other up and so forth, you know. But then you have to step back from that and ask, well, why is this the case? Why do these things happen? Because until we figure out why these things happen, we're not really any closer to a solution to the problem. And if we don't find a solution to the problem, I can tell you, and you can see from what I said earlier about the effects of radioactivity, that really we are all doomed. Now, the, 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 the enormous advances made in medical science in the last hundred years have all but defeated the historic causes of illness and death in children. These are, if you like, smallpox and, and whooping cough and, and all of these uh, uh, diseases related to infection. Um, because these have been defeated by antibiotics and by uh, various chemical substances that kill bacteria. But what we see instead is a developing spectrum of childhood diseases and conditions like cancer and diabetes and asthma and all sorts of development problems like autism, uh, which are very widely distributed. And in fact, the number of children born with these diseases now has increased markedly so that you, if you take children at birth now and look to see uh, whether they're healthy, there, there are actually fewer healthy children at birth now than they, than they used to be at the time of the, um, of the big epidemics. And of course people know this, there's a sort of nervousness about the increasing concentration uh, of, of substances which might be causing these effects. There are an enormous number of, of known genotoxic and potentially develop, developmentally disruptive chemicals and novel radionuclides that I've already spoken about that have been building up in the environment over this period. And, and, and briefly, I want to, just before I move on to the, to the arguments about how this is all happening, to say a few words about how we can know what we think we know. Because the problem at the moment is that science is in the hands of the scientists. But, but the problem is which scientists? In, in my own area, I, I'm involved in court cases uh, at the moment in the High Court in London to do with nuclear test veterans and their children. And the, and, and the judge in the upper tier has ruled, actually illegally as it turns out, but anyway, ruled that I cannot be an expert because I'm biased, because I take a particular point of view, that I say radioactivity is very dangerous. And that means, and because I, I did give talks like this one, because I'm here talking to you now, and on YouTube presumably, or wherever Vimeo, um, it's not something that an expert in a court is allowed to do, according to this judge. Um, but, and, but the problem is, of course, that you get experts from both sides. You'll get an expert in our own court case, or many of the, all of the court cases that I, I, I'm involved in as an expert. There'll be an expert from Exxon, from Chevron, from, from the nuclear industry, from the military, from the Ministry of Defence, these are all different experts, and they take the opposite point of view to me. So we all look at the data, we look at the scientific research reports that there are, and we say, hey, look, this looks like the child is dying because of radiation, and then the expert from the other side says, well, no, it doesn't, because here's a study where people were given radiation and no children got ill. So this is an opposition between two scientists. So the question is, how do we get to the truth? Because that's what we want, we want the truth. And the way to get the truth, I think the only way to get to the truth, and this is what I advised the European Commission uh, uh, in the papers that were published by this policy information network that I work for, is to have both sides of the argument. 
So in other words, you have a, a meeting in which you have the expert who says that there's no problem, and you have an, and you bring in the expert that says that everybody's dying, and you and they both introduce all of the evidence, just like in a court case where you have the defence and you have the prosecution, and the judge sits and it looks at all of this evidence and he decides. And in this case, the judges are the politicians, and that's the only way to do it. But I can tell you at the moment that doesn't happen. What happens at the moment is the people from Exxon or from Monsanto uh, are the ones that advise the, the European Parliament or advise the American government or the, European, or the Environmental Protection Association. So the situation is biased by money because these companies have vast amounts of money, governments have vast amounts of money and they want to make more money and so what they will never do is they will never invest in an expert who says that this substance is dangerous because if that happens, then they will lose money. And this is the essential problem that we have at the moment in terms of child health. And also the problem that we have in terms of adult health as well, and in, in, in all areas, and I shall come to that in, in due course. So as I said here, I spent some time, yes, yeah, so this was about pinch, I was on pinch, and I, and I was looking at all this business of science and policy. And the idea of having a, a, a oppositional committees, committees where you have both sides, was actually an idea of Molly Scott Cato, who I, who was, I was associated with for some time. And uh, it was based on the British Parliament, or on any parliament really, uh, where, where, or indeed on, on legal cases where you have two sides of the argument presented. But that doesn't happen in science. Um, I won't go on about it. But uh, you see, the problem is, of course, that the people with the money are the people who employ the scientists, and those people also prevent the studies being carried out that show that, that what they're doing is wrong. And these are tensions which result in difficulties in obtaining the best scientific advice and translating it into policy. And we told the European Commission this, I don't know whether they've taken any notice of it, but anyway, they certainly had our report where we stated this. And in particular, there's a tension between military strength, industrial development and competitiveness, and economic growth on the one hand, and the exposure to environmental pollutants and ill health in children on the other hand. And this is perfectly clear everywhere you look. So, in other words, countries that want to develop industrially have to do industrial development, which produces concentrations of toxic substances, not just radiation, but all sorts of substances uh, dioxins that get released to the atmosphere which cause cancer, whole ranges of substances like uh, heavy metals that get released to waterways and end up in drinking water or in the air to be inhaled. And of course it's necessary for them to produce these substances in order to have economic growth. And we'll come to the arguments about economic growth in my, in my next presentation. But if you're going to have economic growth then you have to produce toxic substances and those toxic substances kill your children. There's an absolute equation between those two things. And governments know this. They do, do cost-benefit analysis. And in terms of radiation, they would say, for example, and in fact they have said to me, because I've talked to them about this, that it's justifiable to kill one person in a million if you can produce energy which will save other people from getting cold in the wintertime. So this, this sort of equation is, is, is in fact used. It's, it's, it's utilitarianism and it's used. But the problem is, of course, that it's not used accurately because the radiation risk model is the one that says one in a million, whereas the real radiation risk model, the one that works, this one, the ECRR one, says more like 100 or 1,000 in a million. And which sums up to 50 million, you said? Well, uh, yes, of course, in terms of, in terms of infant mortality and cancer, it, 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 over the period of the weapons fallout, we're talking about 60 million cancer deaths and 50 million... Um, dead babies uh, if we increase if we if we include miscarriages and we can include miscarriages because the study that I did with the, with the nuclear test veterans also looked at miscarriages there have been very very few studies of miscarriages but the test veterans study showed that there was an excess risk of miscarriages in the, in the, in the wives of the veterans so the solution is to have oppositional committees uh, and this and, and the solution is to fund independent scientists people like me because nobody funds me, I can tell you that. So all of this is done, this is, this is something that I've done because I felt it necessary to do it. And most of my life has been devoted to working for nothing. 
or for little, very little money, or the, or, the, or the hope of very little money, in order to draw these facts to the attention of the public. Oh, wait, the solution's at... Sorry? Okay. So, we, I, in England, what I suggested, or in the, in the European Union, I suggested that, uh, that a number of things can be done. First of all, we have these discursive or oppositional committees, and secondly, we have to therefore fund independent citizen scientists. So in other words, somebody has to be on the other side of the committee and they have to get money to do this. Because at the moment, all the money goes to the people who work for the military or the people who work for the big business. Um, and then, of course, the other thing is, is we need open access to health data. This is another thing which I haven't mentioned, but in fact, we don't really know what these uh, substances do unless we can study the health effects in people who live close to the places where these substances are released. So, for example, I mean, you may not know, but in England, you're not allowed to get data on cancer close to a nuclear site, and that's true in Europe as well. So if you want to know, if you had a nuclear site here down the road, and everybody said, oh, we're all dying of cancer, you know, and little children are going around with bald heads and white faces and sort of tubes up their noses, you wouldn't be able to find if that was true or not, because they wouldn't give you the data. This is European law. It's, it's law which prevents you to get getting small area data. We wanted to get small area data in Sweden to try and find out whether there was an effect of the Baltic Sea. They refused to give it to us. We went to, to Helsinki to talk to the cancer registry to ask if we could have uh, Finnish data of cancer near the Baltic Sea. They said, no, you can't. We're not going to give it to you. Um, so you can't get this data. So how are we supposed to do these, these studies that we then take into the oppositional committee and we say, look, here's the data that shows that these people are dying near that nuclear power station? Because we can't do it, because they won't give you the data. It's monstrous. It's absolutely monstrous. And so finally, of course, we should... Um, oh, I say here, overhaul of the peer review system using open access publishing, but this seems to be happening. This seems to be happening anyway. Because open access publishing is chasing money, and lots of new journals are appearing all over the place that enables enables independent scientists to publish their work. So this is this is not lots, new. but at least they are starting to pop up. They're starting to do that. Of course, you have to pay some money, but it's not much. So once again, economics rides to the rescue of the poor. Anyway, uh, and in fact, I've been made an, I've been put on the editorial board of one of, one of these outfits. What is the name of it? It's called Jacob's Journal of Epidemiology and Preventive Medicine. And in that you'll find, you'll find an editorial in the first edition written by me, which actually states, and this is a peer-reviewed journal, all of these things that I've been telling you about the, uh, the measurement of ill health effects near nuclear sites. And the way that I did it, and I, this was way back, I figured out that if you can't get the data from the government, what you could do is you could go and knock on doors. So we got... Uh, or the, go to the cemetery. Yeah, or go to the cemetery. But in, 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 in the studies that I've published in this, journal, in this journal, one that's coming up quite soon, a publication about a nuclear site in Wales, um, we got the TV company to go and knock on doors and say, excuse me, how many people live here and has anybody had cancer in the last five years? And as a result of that, we got an enormously big response. And we found out that there was a five-fold excess of cancer in the people living downwind of this nuclear power station about three kilometers away. But of course we would have never got that data from the government. The government would refuse to give it to us. And when the TV company produced a, a documentary on this, they were attacked by the government who said that it was unethical. It was unethical for them to go and ask people whether they had cancer or not. <laughs> Can you imagine? They got really angry. They wanted to send me to jail for, for setting up an unethical study. Anyway, they didn't do that. Very ethical they are. Of course, yeah, hiding right. all the data. That's right. That's right. They hide the data, and we have to. We have to, and that's why this. That's why we have this organisation that, that 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 I'm talking to you from now. Because if we don't take control of this, then we're finished. So we we have all. all so now. So if you like, now is the time for all good men and true to come to the aid of the party. This party, the policy information party, the the. the the party that is trying to sort of get this information out there. And also, and the other thing we said was that there should be a government department which combines environment and health. At the moment, you have two departments. You have environment, directorate environment, and you have directorate of health. They're two separate things. So if we do all of this, our children can be strong, healthy, 
happy. <laughs> Let it happen. Thank you. Thank you. So now, oh, so, well, yeah, but then I haven't done the other one. Do you want me to now go straight into the talking about this? I think we should cut that one and start and just start this, the third one because they're too long otherwise, you know. And the third will be the, the name of... The third will be the one about the planetary impact index and, and, and what we should do and so on. Okay, yeah. so you can see it in the next sequence. Yeah.